Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the metro region of the Los Angeles International Church of Christ. It's great to have everybody with us this morning. Greetings to everybody, especially the metro family right here. And it's good to see you all, at least in my mind, and be seen by you on Be Together. And a, and a special greeting to our San Francisco brothers and sisters. And a great to have you with us. And, it's, and all our friends and family and co-workers, whoever's with us this morning, uh, welcome. It's great to have you here. Uh, now's the time we, we jump into the scriptures and, and just juice it for all we can, that we can learn, that we can grow, that we can uh, uh, become just better and better for God, be more and more what we all want to be. I know a lot of us have set goals and different things that we want to grow this year. It's great to have you, and I think this, the series that we're going to be doing over the next several weeks will be really great and helpful for that. My name is Robert Carrillo. For those of you who don't know me, and I'm the, um, the minister here serving in the metro region of the Los Angeles Church, and uh, it's great to have this time together. We're going to open our Bibles to John 15. The title of the class uh, or the lesson, the study we're doing today is Abiding in Him. And I love the word abiding. That's why I'm, I'm picking that word. That's why I'm using that word. Uh, it, because it, it, it's, it's not a common word for us anymore. It's more a, an older English term. But I love what it, what, what it makes you think about, about really remaining, about staying. Uh, so I'm going to use a couple of different versions of, of Scripture. And so that's why it'll be a little different depending on the Bible that you have. But um, so go ahead and get your Bibles out or turn them on and go to John 15 because we're going to read a few scriptures. And this is going to be our entire study right here. We're not we're not going anywhere else. We're just going to break this down and juice it, because as many of you know, our theme this year is in him. So it's uh, in in him, the father, the son and the Holy Spirit. And today today's lesson is in him, in Jesus, being connected to Jesus um, that we're pre-taping. This is only, uh, what is this, uh, uh, January 14th, I think we're at. Um, so you're going to see this in, a, in about 10, 15 days. Um, but I will say that, uh, um, you know, we, we've got to keep in prayer and uh, about the world's events and what's going on around us. Uh, I don't know what will happen <laughs> over the next 10 days, but I do know that Jesus will remain the same. And he always does, and we can always count on him no matter what happens. And hopefully the last few days you have been in prayer, especially with the inauguration and the transfer of power. Um, I don't know when I'm taping this what's going to happen, but Lord willing, things will go well. So we're going to focus now on John chapter 15. Let's go ahead and go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for the word of God, for your word, your letter to us, your text sent to us, God, that we can learn so much from, that we can be moved by. And uh, Father, we want to follow all that you teach us. We want to have our hearts open, our minds open. We want to have a humble attitude that you and your word can just transform us, God, and make us into what you call us to be so that we can be uh, a light to our families and friends. We can be a light to our communities and a light to this world, God. Please uh, help us, Father, to learn as much as we can, God, over this next, uh, uh, next 20, 30, 40 minutes of studying the Bible, God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so abiding in Him, a great lesson. Um, it's about the gardener, the vine, and the fruit, right? Um, and uh, it's, it's almost a parable. It's not really a parable. It's an analogy. It's a metaphor that Jesus used to help us understand. But like the parables, you know, he used a very colorful, very practical illustrations that people understood. You know, a lot of us, we, we miss a lot because we're not an agrarian society anymore. We are, a, 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 you know, more... Uh, we're more uh, city people. We don't know how to grow grapes or how to grow fruit. Most of us don't. I mean, a lot of us, some of us do, and that's awesome. And and uh, we even have uh, somebody doing classes on that in a podcast, which is awesome. Fantastic. Um, but uh, I think these are basic analogies that most of us will understand. Um, so Matthew or John 15, verse 1, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. I am the true vine and my father is, and this is an older version, says the farmer, you know, or in the new NIV says the gardener. So he tells us who's who and what's what, right? That Jesus is the true vine and his, and his father, God, is the farmer. He's the one that's working all this. And 
And of course, we are the fruit and we have the responsibility of bearing fruit. We are both the fruit and the branches uh, bearing more fruit. We are the fruit of Jesus's ministry, but we are also the branches bearing more fruit. And um, the, 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 the key thing, and I think from the very beginning, we're just going to walk through this because it's so rich and it has so many great things uh, for us to learn from, and especially with our theme being in him. You know, the, the, the first fact that we're just kind of put out there with us, put out there to us is the fact that he's the true vine. You know, Jesus is the one. The, this comes, of course, out of John. We studied John uh, before. Uh, and, and John, one of the classic characteristics of John is the I am statements, the seven I am statements, where Jesus teaches us and helps us to understand exactly who he is, which is really important in our life and, and how our life is lived and how our life ends up and the quality of our life depends a lot on us understanding Jesus in our life. And he will have the greatest impact on us or could have the greatest impact on us if we allow him, if we understand that he is the true life, that he is the true vine, right? So the classic seven statements, they all start with I am, which is in itself a very significant beginning, right? Because when Moses was asked, who shall I say sent me? God said the I am. The, the, here in Greek, it's the ego a me, which is a, a, a kind of a double, a double statement in the sense that it's me, I am. And that's, that, that's the way it comes out in Greek. And since most people listen to the scriptures, they would have heard the scriptures either in Greek or Hebrew, but especially the Greek was the, pop, the more popular translation of the Bible at the time. They would be very familiar with his statement orally being said, I am in Hebrew or Aramaic and written down in I am being ego a me. And, and, and so that statement says a lot because they would have immediately thought of that time that Moses asked and God answered, I am is sending you. And, and some, some translators put it the, the ising one or the one who is, but that's the, that phrase is the phrase that Jesus used. And that immediately connects him to God. And he's showing people that he is God. And he says, I ego a me, the bread of life, right? I am, I, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the true vine. That's who Jesus is. And I mean, that in itself is a whole sermon, but it's important that we understand this, these, these terms I am and, and what they mean to us. And, and, and if we know who he is and we know how powerful he is, you know how much he loves us, we know what his, our role is to him, it helps us to understand why it's so important that we connect with him. Because really our life depends on it. And everything we do and everything we hope to and aspire, I've traveled all over the world and I've gotten with everything from kings and queens of countries to, to the poorest of the poor in the most you know, impoverished parts of the world, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, in the Middle East, and on refugee routes in Europe, and, and of course, you know, even here in the United States. And there are certain things that all people have in common. They all want to have a good life. Everybody wants to be able to take care of their children. Everybody wants to have a good marriage and a good family and be able to, to, to raise up their kids and feed them. And when they get sick, to be able to have access to medicine, to be able to send your kids to school, to be able to meet the basic needs of life that make us happy, that make us content, that, that bring joy to our life. Because that's what, I mean, all of us are wired in such a way. We won't want that. What we have to understand is Jesus is the way to achieve that. Jesus is the life that we want. That is the life that he offers, that connection, that joy, that contentment, that peace, that security. And if we know that, then we know where to get it. And we know what's most important. If we have that clear in our minds, then, then we're not out there chasing money and chasing fame and chasing power and chasing material goods like the rest of the world. And why do they do that? 
because they want to be joyful, because they want to be content, because they want to be happy. They just, they're taking the wrong road. They're taking the wrong route. And that road does not take you there, but Jesus does. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he says in verse two, every branch in me not bearing fruit, he takes it away. And every branch bearing fruit, he cleans in order that it may bear more fruit. So Jesus is, he starts to, to tell us how this relationship works and what happens. Not only how is it so important, but how it works. And he, and he, and he's, he says a few key words in there. But you know, this, this verse is, is probably oftentimes considered kind of one of the most scary verses in the Gospels because we think of being thrown out and burned and, you know, as a useless branch and nobody wants that. I think the wording is, is, is important. The, the Greek word is iro, the, the meaning to raise up, to elevate to, or to raise from the ground, to take up stones, to, to, to draw away, to, to remove, right? To carry off. In other words, if, if you're not connected to G, if you're pretending you're eventually going to be carried off. You're eventually going to be taken away. Um, that, that your life and everything that we, all the promises of God depend on our connection to Jesus, our ability to, to be in him, to walk in him, to live in him, to survive, to thrive, to live and die in him. That, that, that has the biggest impact on our lives. And if we don't have a good connection, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I think of, you know, with, with all the changes in technology, you know, phones aren't as dependable as they used to be. It used to be you could just count on the phone working. Well, now, you know, you got to be in a good signal area. You got you to have the right plan and all these things, the right speed, all this stuff. Or, or you get a bad connection. You'd have to hang up and do it again. Uh, but if you don't have a good connection, you cannot communicate. You cannot connect to the person you're trying to reach out to. And, and, and it, you know, if they're cutting out, if they're freezing, if they're not, if they're not flowing, the, the information in the exchange isn't flowing, nothing happens. That's basically what he's saying is that, that the branches that bear no fruit will be carried away. The other, the other important word is the word kathiro, or uh, we get, we say the word catharsis from this. It means to cleanse the, to cleanse, to wash away, to take the filth out, to take the impurities out, to prune, to clean, if you know those of you who practice gardening or raise uh, or grow your own fruit or grow your vegetables or grow even you know fruit trees, you know you have to trim, you have to clean, you have to you have to take care of the tree. You can't sit there and demand fruit from the tree. You have to water it, and nourish it, and and take care of it. And God does that. He purifies us. He cleans us. He helps us. He provides things if we allow Him to. And this is really, really key that we've got to allow him to. We got to be the people that say, God, whatever you want to do with me, if you, if you, you want to, you want to make me grow in certain areas, you want to show me what I need to change, you want to, you know, and he provides all these things. In fact, the very next line, he says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. This is the impact of the word of God. The word of God cleanses us. The word of God purifies us. That is a very real thing. You know, I used to think, well, you know, you just have to obey God and you got to be religious and you got to do your, you know, Bible reading, your memory scripture stuff. And because that's what Christians do. But I really didn't know the impact of that, how that changes the way I think, which changes the way I feel, it changes what I fill my brain with affects my heart and affects my soul. And it makes me a different person. It's how God transforms us. The word of God, it's incredibly powerful. I mean, he made creation with his words, right? I mean, the Bible in, in Hebrews 1, it tells us that all things are sustained by the power of the word of Jesus, right? By, so, I mean, the, his word is incredibly important. So when we're reading the scriptures, we're not just reading a book. I mean, all, all of us who, I, mean, I know in this church, who became Christians, first we started out by reading the scriptures. And we were moved and we were challenged and we were inspired. We were convicted. We were, we were, we were so compelled by the love of Christ and by God's love and, and also by the fear of hell and the fear of, of being judged for what we'd done in the past that we, it moved us in the right direction, but it also changed how we thought. It, you know, 
the, the, the love that we felt by the people who reached out to us was incredibly important, was essential, but that's not what changed us. What actually changed us was the word of God. It changed our minds. It changed how we think. I have lots of friends uh, from before I was a Christian. I had some great friends. They didn't change my life. It wasn't the wisdom of the person studying the Bible with you. It's, it was the spirit of God moving through his word. That's what changed us. That's what changed our heart. It wasn't clever arguments for new doctrine or clever arguments for starting going to a new church. It was the word of God that changed us and made us open to the changes and the new direction in our life. And, and God saying, basically, Jesus saying that, that is provided for you. You are being continually cleansed, pruned. You're continually being set up for victory through his word. So it's a big key in what does it mean to abide in him? What does it mean to stay connected to Jesus or to live in him? Our theme for this year, what does that mean to live in Jesus? You know, and he, and he says in verse four, the, the classic statement, abide in me as I in you. And I love this. You know, there's a, one of my all time favorite movies. I think the best Star Wars movie was uh, Rogue. Uh, what is it called? Rogue One. Um, it, it's, it, it's just, a, it's, to me, it's one of the best Star Wars movies. And, and, you know, it's basically a group of people giving their lives to what they believe in. Knowing they're going to die, they go and they, you know, spoiler alert, I guess if you haven't seen it, but if you haven't seen it, repent. But, you know, they, they, they lay down their lives for what they believe and for, for good and for righteousness. And I love it. But there's a line in there where the, the guy that he's kind of like a Jedi, but he's not a Jedi. He's, a, he's, he's blind and he carries a staff and he's just an incredible fighter. And he has this phrase, he says, uh, I in the four, I forget now I'm, I'm preaching, I forget the phrase. Uh, the force is one with me and I am one with the force, something like that. And he says it over and over. That phrase, it's a really cool phrase, but they stole that from early Christians who would say phrases over and over like, I am one in the spirit and the spirit is, I am one with the spirit and the spirit is one with me. I am one with Jesus and Jesus is in me. And that would, the, the, these kind of phrases were used in the early church and they, they seem just like religious things to say, but they're actually not. They literally, in recent discoveries in, in neuro, neuropsychology and neuroplasticity, have shown that these kind of phrases, this kind of thing, actually rewires your brain. It actually helps you grow and, and, and form neural pathways that literally change how you behave. They change your behavior, they change who you are and what you are and how you see yourself. That phrase is incredibly important. Abide in me as I in you. Abide in him. Be in him and he will be in you. I am one with the Lord and the Lord is one with me. I am in the Lord and the Lord is in me. We are one. And, and just knowing that and understanding that, I mean, think about it. It gives us strength. It gives us hope. It gives us courage. It gives us faith. It, 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 it certainly helps us to say no to sin. If you have that clear in your mind, you're not going to be wanting to look at things or hear things or be involved in things that are offensive to God. If that's our mindset, we don't even want to deal with junk. We don't even want to get into garbage in the world. We, we don't want stuff like pornography or, or trash you know, or in our life. We, just, we, we, we want to be pure because Jesus is in us because the Holy Spirit is in us. Much of this is just understanding that and understanding how all that works. You know, there's details, and I'm just gonna give some practicals of how we remain in him, how we abide in him. Um, we have the Bible, right? We just talked about that, how the power of the word, the power of the word that he gives us to keep us connected. Uh, so what do we do with that? Well, we, we need to practice in-depth study. You know, when you're a brand new Christian and you're just reading it, that's totally fine. You're reading it and whatever hits you, hits you. It's like throwing the spaghetti in the wall and plenty sticks to the wall that you know you're getting a whole lot out of it. But if you've been reading the same thing 20 times or over 30 years, and it, it's very easy to slip into, I already know all this stuff. 
So we've got to go deeper. We've got to dig deeper. We've got to listen to classes. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to read commentaries. We've got to read books that break it down for us and help us to know what's going on. But this is something we should be good at and we should be getting better and better with time at this, knowing, you know, what, what, what commentaries I like or don't like or what, what, what studies I want to do. Or, and I mean, I have a blast doing all kinds of studies, you know, character studies, uh, book studies, uh, topical studies. There's just lots of different ways to study the Bible. You could, you could study all the great women of the, of the lineage of Jesus. Man, what a powerful study that would be, you know, or you could study a word, you know, you study out the word. I've, I've encouraged everybody to study out the word misfat or the study out the, the word hesed. You know, those are the basic things that Jesus, that God calls for us in our life with him. Um, memorization of scriptures, being able to memorize scriptures, that changes us. I guarantee you, a few years ago, I set out to memorize the Sermon on the Mount and, you know, I, I think I'm at a point in life where I got so many things in my head that it's, it's really challenging for me to memorize, but I memorize things. And unfortunately, they'll disappear in a few months if I don't keep using them. But I tell you what, when I memorize them, I think of it all the time. That Sermon on the Mount just changed my life because I kept seeing situations and think of those scriptures. I used the scriptures a lot. I shared the scriptures a lot. I referred to the scriptures a lot. And it felt like, it's, it's like it was my Swift's army pocket knife, you know. I had it always in my pocket. Different scriptures, things he said in the Sermon on the Mount. It was amazing how many things it applied to in practical life. But that was because I memorized it. Uh, you know, some of us have been memorizing scriptures last year that have been put out in the bulletin. But I'm just telling you, this is a way to be, have a strong connection with God, to abide in him. Um, contemplation. You know, that, that we take time to contemplate. Well, what does that mean? You know, this is something that's kind of reviving right now in, in, the, in the Christian world. And, but even in our fellowship, it's just beginning to kind of hit the general population of how important this is and how to do it. I'm really excited. Turnwell and I are going to team up and do some, some videos on how to meditate, how to breathe, do breathing exercise, how to, you know, live a life of contemplation, basically where you read scripture and you break it down in your mind, you think about it, you listen, you share it, you, uh, there's just so many things that can be done with scripture to help it sink in, to absorb it. You know, even sharing scriptures, when you, when you memorize scripture or you just memorize where it is and you share it and you think, okay, I want to share this scripture with three people and look for opportunities that at least imprints your mind and heart and also impacts them as well. And, and there's so many practical uses where we, we can share, you know, hey, this scripture, that scripture. And we should have those. We should have those in our backpack, so to speak. You know, in our spiritual bag, we should have, you know, if, if somebody's struggling with anger, if somebody's struggling with discouragement, or somebody's struggling with temptation in particular sin, we got a scripture for that. We got some verses that'll help. Somebody's down. I know I, I turn to this verse. I turn to that verse. And, 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 and then obviously practicing those scriptures. You know, and putting those, in there. I tell you what, when I, when I memorized the, the Sermon on the Mount, every time I was tempted with something, I would think of this scripture. I would think of that scripture and I would think, okay, I need to be this way. You know, I need to settle matters, matters quickly when I get in, you know, in something that I, in some kind of conflict or, or the, I mean, there's just so many ways. And the more we practice it, the more it becomes us. Prayer, in, in, the, in, many, in many ways, it's, it's another reinforcement that helps us to abide in Him, to remain in Him. You know, that we practice time every day, every day. We just needs to become who we are, that we praise God every day, that we offer thanksgiving every day, that we spend time contemplating with God. You know, sometimes you, you pull out your journal and you read a scripture and you think about everything it means and you listen, you know, you listen Okay, well, God, what, is, what are you telling me here? And ask God to whisper in your heart, to whisper in your mind. And it's amazing sometimes how things just come to your mind. I mean, it happens to me a lot, you know. I, in fact, whenever I study or I pray even, I always have to have my journal nearby because things come to me and I got to write them down real quick, you know, or I'll forget them. By the end of the prayer, I'll have forgotten things that came to me. But practice listening, practice contemplating, be continual in it, you know, that we're supposed to be continually in prayer, right? We're at prayer without ceasing. 
And, and so we should be praying throughout the day. That's a lifestyle. And the, and the, the truth is that a lot of times we, we make some headway and then it just kind of evaporates and we're not doing it anymore. And the challenge this year that, uh, that in our ministry, the ministries that, that uh, I'm working with is, is for all of us to have the greatest spiritual year ever. And we have to practice these things and, and even writing them down, sometimes writing the scriptures down, you know, writing the prayers down that we, that we're praying. That's, it's a great exercise because some, it's very different than just sitting down talking to God, writing a letter to God. We have to, a little more time to think about what we're saying, to, to organize our thoughts. And, and, you know, I've got journals, Michelle's got journals going back 35 years, 38 years. We've got a big box. I've got journals going back to when she was a teenager. Uh, where things, prayers that she's written to God. Sometimes it's cool to open those up and look at what was on our heart and what was on our mind and what we were, we were asking God. But taking the time to write it, I would encourage everybody who's a disciple of Jesus to have a journal that you're writing in, to be a journal person, you know? And I know it's not for everybody. Some people are like, ah, I can't do that. Well, there's other things you can do, but I'm telling you, it's a wonderful tool. And, and, and of course, there's the old outline, the classic outline, Acts, when we pray, which is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Supplication is asking for things. You know, Jesus said, you not have because you, don't, you did not ask. So it, it, God does want us to ask. And it's not that he doesn't know these things, but it helps us to connect. You know, I don't talk to my wife just for an exchange of information. I talk to my wife so that we can be connected so that we can be one mind, one heart. So just because you think, well, good, doesn't God know what I want? Yeah, of course he does, but he wants to hear it from you and he wants you to share it with him. And it's good. And even adoration is, it's not, it's not for, for, for God. It's not like God is insecure and he needs us to lift him up and make him feel good about himself. No, God, God's totally secure. It's good for us to practice adoration. What's adoration? That's praise. That's, that's, you know, telling God how awesome he is, thank you. And then, of course, thank, uh, Thanksgiving is, is thanking him for things. All these things are really good for us. And they help us connect to God. And they seem just like stuff you do, like just religious stuff, but they're powerful things. And you have to know that. If we want to have the greatest year we've had ever in our Christian life, in our spiritual history, these things are things that we can practice and that will make a huge difference. And of course, you know, the, 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 just speaking of practice, just the things that involve practice, living in obedience, trying to obey his commands, right? This is what he's going to say here. Um, practicing the things that we read. When we read something that we're not practicing, write it down. Say, okay, I need to start practicing this. I, I need to settle, maybe I don't settle matters quickly. I need to start settling matters quickly. It says, it says to, you know, love our neighbor. Okay, but am I doing that? Am I really doing that? Am I, you know, is there, are there people around me that I'm just not loving? I'm not paying attention. I'm not, you know, focused on it. it there's so many, so many things that Jesus teaches us about life and it's easy to get just used to the things that he said. And that's what we do. And we don't think about other things. That's why we need to read. That's why we need to contemplate. That's why we need to meditate on it. That's why we need to memorize scriptures because then we think of it and we're becoming more and more like him. Not so that we can be saved. He already said, you've already been cleaned. You've been catharsis. You've already been cleansed by his word. This is because you love him and you want to be connected and so that you can bear much fruit. And, and, you know, we, it, it causes continual growth. So we, we, the, the, the practice of sharing, sharing what we're learning, sharing what we're growing in, sharing about Jesus, sharing about God, sharing our faith. And, I, and, and sharing our faith doesn't mean inviting somebody to church. Sharing your faith means telling people about God in your life. And how he works in your life and the great things that have happened and the good news of the kingdom. And that's what sharing your faith is. Not just handing out, not that handing out invitations is wrong or bad. Many of us are, are Christians today because somebody handed us an invitation. I'm not saying that's bad. That's a good thing. But sharing your faith is much richer than that. It's much bigger than that. It's much deeper than that. And, and even doing this with other Christians, other disciples, other people, there's, there's a power just in a group. You sit down with your, your group of friends and you read a scripture and you all talk about what it means to you. 
you know, the, the, the practice of Lectio Divina, which, which is becoming popular again. This was an ancient practice in, among Christians, and it's becoming popular again, where you read a scripture several times, you pray, you listen, you discuss what it means. But doing this together, is my point, is also a, an incredible practice that connects us to Jesus, keeps us all connect, connected. And there's different spiritual exercises that are out there, like fasting and meditating and prayer and all these things, all of these things just help us build a strong connection, a very strong connection with the vine, which we want to be, right? We want to be abiding in him. He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. We, we've, we've got to abide in him. We've got to stay in him. And you know what Satan's out there to do? The enemy is out to pull you off. The enemy is hoping that you're not well connected. You know, when fruit's not well connected, I, I, have, a, I have an avocado tree. And, you know, it takes a few years before it starts bearing fruit. So I've been growing it since it was a little tiny sapling. And I was so excited because this year, uh, this year, it, it grew, it, it, it sprouted like about 15 different avocados. And I was like, woohoo, I was so excited. And then we had some travel uh, and, and some different things that happened. And I wasn't paying attention to how frequently I was watering it. And the next thing I knew, they all fell off. And I was so bummed. I was so bummed. And I was down to like three at one point, And they were like this big. And then they were this big. And then I went out there and one fell off. And then the next day, the other two fell off. And I was just, I was so bummed. But they were really easy to knock off because they weren't getting enough water. And I didn't realize that until actually my, my uncle said something about how it's important to water them a lot when they, when they start bearing fruit. And I realized I never upped how much I was watering them and I wasn't paying attention. They had a weak connection. So yeah, they started growing and they grew a little bit, boom, and they all fell off. And I was so bummed. And, and so that connection is so incredibly important. And here's the thing about it. We can't do anything without it. We, we really can't do anything without a solid connection with Jesus. All those dreams that we have of a great life and a great marriage and great family and, and happiness and contentness and security and, and being at peace with the world around us, those aren't going to happen without Jesus. They're just not. And I know people think that if you have enough money, you'll have those things. If you have enough talent or if you're good looking enough or, or you have a, the right career, the right job, or, and they don't, or the right relationships, they don't. Because none of those things bring this other than your connection with God and our connection with Jesus. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain on the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me, Jesus said. What is the quality of your connection? That's, you know, that's the thing that we need to evaluate right now. We need to evaluate. We need to stop thinking about, okay, how well connected am I to God? Am I to Jesus? You know, Jesus talked about several times, I never knew you. You know, when he, when he, in Matthew 7, Sermon on the Mount, you know, and they say, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? Do we not cast out demons in your name? He said, away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. These people thought they knew Jesus. But they did not. They did not. And it's kind of like, you know, sometimes when you've ever done marriage counseling or been in a marriage counseling session. I know that, that you know, I'll, I'll ask, how are you guys doing in your relationship? And the young couples, this is classic young couple thing. The guy will say, oh, we're doing great. And then I look at the wife and she starts crying, you know, and, and starts spilling her guts about how terrible things have been. And it's like, that's just the classic scenario. Just because I think my relationship is great with my wife does not mean it is great. It's when she agrees and she feels like it's a great relationship, then it's a great relationship. And that applies to roommate situations, friendships, that applies to all relationships. So the question is not really, do you think it's a great connection? Does God think it's a great connection? Does he feel like he knows you? Do you really know him? And the things that I've just been talking about are the things that make that happen that help us to abide in him, to live in him and walk in him. Poor connection, he says, equals little fruit. Okay, you wanna know, well, that, that's the acid test, that's the litmus test right there, is how's my fruit? What is the fruit of my life? 
What is the fruit of my life? And he says, I am the grapevine, you are the branches. The one abiding in me and I in him, this one bears much fruit. So the person who's, who's well connected to God, well connected to Jesus, they're going to bear much fruit. But be, he says, but apart from me, you can do nothing. So if we're doing nothing, then we got to really stop and ask ourselves, how connected am I? It's one of the dangers of knowing a lot in the church. When we're in the church a long time, we know a lot of stuff about living the church life. And we know how to kind of just gut through life. But we're not bearing fruit. And our life really isn't bearing fruit. Now let me explain what fruit means. Because I think sometimes we have a very simplistic view of fruit. You know, the, there's the obvious duplication. That's where you, you're helping other people to become like you, basically. We're wired in such a way that we're influenced by other people. And, and when Jesus said in Matthew 28, go and make disciples... Actually, in the Greek, it's go disciple them and teach them or train them to obey everything. So we duplicate ourselves. And I'm not even talking about yet about making other disciples. I'm talking about helping other disciples to get at least to where you're at. And, and we're duplicating what we've been given. I have been blessed with some incredible, incredible teachers in my life. People like Sam Lang, who discipled and trained Michelle and I in the ministry and appointed us evangelists and ministry, women's ministry leader. Stephen Lisa Johnson, who discipled us for many years and taught us some incredible things. Matt and Stacy Fridley, we learned so much from them. Sam and Cynthia Powell, and, and I could just go on and on and on. And I've learned a lot from friendships. People like Guillermo and Terry Adame, who were just so close to and bonded with and and now here with Doug and Joanne and Reese and Grace and 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 I'm and I'm getting so much from them. I receive so much. I am obligated, righteously obligated to share all these great things that I've learned and and the training for years. And so that the next guy doesn't need to take 38 years to learn what I know. So I share with them. And then, of course, that's, that's duplication. So freely I've received, freely I should give. But there's also reproduction. And there's also, you know, where, where, where we're basically reproducing ourselves. We're helping people to become Christians. And I think that's the, the, the primary, that duplication and reproduction are the primary intent of this discussion that we're producing. But it's not the only intent. And there are many times where Jesus would say things that could be taken multiple ways and all of them apply. I, I, there's absolutely, there's this, the, the fruit of our, my life of helping other people become Christians. Matthew 28, both parts of that. Making disciples and teaching them. That's, that's basically duplication and reproduction. You know, that we're, we're helping people to become Christians and we're helping Christians to become strong in the Lord. You know, it's, and, and then there, but there's a whole other set of fruit too that, that the Bible talks about. There's spiritual fruit. And that's, you know, we're talking about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, self-control. You say, well, those are the fruits of the Spirit. Absolutely. But the Spirit is in us, right? And it should be producing that in our life. So that's what we, that's really, if we're going to look at, okay, how am I doing my connection? How's my fruit? Am I helping other people learn what I've learned? Am I helping people become Christians? Am, am I growing in love and joy and peace it, you know, and it, it's, boy, this time, of, this kind of a year that we've had, and even with all that's going on this year, 2021, how valuable is peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faith, and self-control. These are all the fruit of the Spirit. These are things that everybody wants. Everybody, from every religion, from every background, from every social economic level, everybody wants these things. But the source is Jesus. The source is God, and that depends on our connection. I am the grapevine, you are the branches, the one abiding in me, and I in him. This one bears much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, I've shared this before, but I'm going to share it again because it fits the point so well. In, in New York, there's a, the statue of Atlas, and, um, and you can see him holding up the globe you know, and all his muscles are rippling and you can see every muscle in his body and he's carrying the weight and you can see he's just straining to hold up the world. And that's a, it's a very classic statue. Uh, but this one particular one in New York, 
Right down the street, there's another statue. And it's a statue actually of the boy Jesus, of a young Jesus. And he's just standing there holding the globe in his hand. And he doesn't even look like he's worried about it. He's stressed about it. He's anxious about it. He's just holding it. Almost like a little kid holding a ball. And that is Jesus. He holds us in the palm of his hand. Not stressed, not anxious, not tired, not weary, not burdened. Because he's Jesus. And the only way we're going to achieve that is our connection to him and being in him. You know, th this is another one of my favorite analogies. Uh, the, you know, the, there was, a, well, there have been many research projects, but one that they did a documentary on where the, they sent this special camera that was, that was going to go to the bottom of the sea. It was, uh, I, I believe it was in the Marianas Trench in, in the Caribbean, deepest places on the earth of the ocean, in the ocean, and where there are literally thousands of pounds of pressure per square inch. No human could go down there. You'd just be flattened like a pancake. Um, in fact, they can't even send cameras down there because they'll just get squished. They'll get crushed by the tremendous pressure. So they build this whole case that's going to go down to the bottom of the ocean. It's steel. It's reinforced. It has all these bars going across. It's like multi-layered thicknesses of glass so that it doesn't get crushed. And they go down there. What did they find down there? Because nobody had ever been there. There had never been pictures. There never, nobody had ever been close to being the bottom. And, and they sent this down there with a camera. What did they find? They found fish. They found fish. Look at this fish. His weird fish, really. You know, I mean, his, his head see-through. I mean, but the fish were just swimming around. Creepy looking fish um, that were swimming around down there. How in the world do they survive under tens of thousands of pounds of pressure per square inch? How do they not get just flattened? If, if, if a camera made out of metal could be just squished, how do these fish survive that? Well, I'll tell you how. <laughs> because their body has equilibrium. It, it has the equal amount of pressure pushing out so that it balances their environment. See, we have to do the same thing. We have to have the peace that transcends understanding, the confidence in God pushing out against the world's pressure, stress, and tension. We have to have the same strength or greater strength that we can draw from so that we don't get crushed by the world. We don't get, our faith doesn't get crushed. That only happens abiding in Jesus. He says in verse five, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, whatever you want, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. And I'm, not, I'm not saying that you, know, you can ask for a Maserati and you'll have one in your driveway in the morning. But the things that are good for us, the things, it all has to, of course, be within God's will. And it has to be good things. But there are good things that we're not really striving for, that God wants to give us. Like peace, like patience, like kindness. And the more we strive to be, and, we, and, and, and it's actually not striving for those things. It's striving for Jesus and asking for those things. And he can give it to us. The question we have to always ask ourselves is, what do I really want? You know, I mean, people work, they study, they go after high top level jobs and careers and titles. They go after the big salaries. Why? Why do they do that? Well, because they want money. Why? Because they want security. Why? Because they want to be happy. Why? Because that's what they know. Well, if you want to be happy, it isn't that path. It's Jesus. And you will never find happiness pursuing in happiness. We find happiness by pursuing God, pursuing Jesus, and building that connection. And we'll close out with this. As the Father loves me, I also love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. This is verse, I jumped to verse 9 because we're out of time. I've got to wrap up. My love, just as I have kept the commandments of my Father and I and am abiding in His love. He's, he's basically saying, look, just stick with me. Walk my path. Live the life I give you. Follow my direction. Yes, obey. Just do it. Just do it. If it's going to help you, just get up and read. Get up and pray. 
Block out a good amount of time. Invest in your spiritual well-being. It will make all the difference in the world. Because why? Because Jesus is in God. And if we're in Jesus, watch out. The sky's the limit of the great things that can happen in our life. The peace, the strength, the confidence, the security, the power of an indestructible life. But we have to abide in him. Without that, we've got nothing. I've spoken these things to you in order that my joy may be in you, Jesus said. And your joy be made full. What does Jesus want? He he, he wants us joyful. Even in tough times. Even in difficulties. And he provides everything we need. But the question is, are we in him? Are we walking in him? And if we're willing to invest in that, the dividends are outrageous. They're so good. Life to the full. So a. So I leave you with this call. Make it your best spiritual year ever. I don't care if you've been in the church one year, 20 years, 50 years. Man, I just talked to some brothers and sisters, some brothers and sisters in the San Francisco House Church. They've been Christians 45 years. It's so funny. I remember I told somebody, uh, Michelle's been a Christian 40 years. And they said, has the kingdom been around that long? Uh, yeah, the kingdom's been around 2,000 years. The question today is, how's your connection? How's your in him? Stay in him. Be in him. Thrive in him. Make that connection strong and watch what God does and the fruit that you will bear because of it. It's the little thing that changes everything. It's a game changer. God bless you. Stay in Him. Gracias por estar este tiempo con nosotros estudiando la Biblia y aprendiendo de Jesús. Si quieres saber más, puedes ir a la página estudiar.com. Punto L A I C C punto N E T